Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. He got swallowed. Now they don't know yet about the three days. They go home. They're telling everybody about it. Eventually, Jonah gets out of the fish, chapter 2 and verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The Lord communicated with the fish. He created his fish, created just for this purpose to swallow Jonah. And when time was right, uh, he puts him out on the land. Does somebody see this? Was somebody there when Jonah, when this massive fish, you know, beaches itself and all of a sudden, there comes Jonah out? Did people see that? Who is that? That's Jonah. That's Jonah. You remember those sailors that are telling us about he got swallowed by that fish three days ago and their story? And here's how the story gets started. And it's not just a story, it's truth. And this begins to spread about this great prophet named Jonah who disobeyed God. A great fish swallowed him. Now he's out on here walking among us. How can you deny that? There's witnesses who saw him being swallowed. Witnesses who are seeing him walking around after this event. News is spreading about this man and what's happened to him. Then in chapter 3 and verse 3, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh, shall be overthrown. So he doesn't hesitate. He goes to Nineveh. People are talking about him. They know him from being a prophet before this. And you just didn't do this. Nineveh was an enemy of Israel. They they hated each other. And Nineveh was pretty was a pretty wicked city or a group of individuals for what they did, how they treated the enemy, including Israel. If you lived in Nineveh, you had the women had to wear a veil, a complete covering. Men could have as many wives as they wanted. Uh, they would for the enemies, they would kill their children. And say if they were to go and capture you and your family they would kill the children in front of you, in front of the parents. But just, but, but just before they would kill your children in front of you, they would put your eyes out, the parents. So that would be the last thing you would see would be that of your children dying. And then they eventually would kill you. Then, then they would skin you. They would skin you after you're dead, or probably maybe some while they were alive, I don't know, but then they would take the skin and put it on the posts of their temples where they worship all these gods. And then they might take an individual and pale them on stakes around the city. I mean, it, it was a very wicked place. They would tear out people's tongues if they would, when they would torture them. Uh, they would feed the bodies to the dogs, I mean, and to the swine of these individuals that they killed and tortured. Nineveh was a rough place, bad place. And there's some places even today over in the Middle East, if you, if you remember back during all these wars going on the last 20 years or so, how they would treat people, how they would torture people, very similar. So times haven't changed a whole lot. So here is Jonah walking through this city talking about the one true God and what he's going to do. 
if you went over to some of these Middle Eastern cities today, let's say, pick out one in Afghanistan, and you walk down the streets holding the Bible, and you tell the people, if you don't repent, you're going to die. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God's going to wipe you off the face of the earth. How long do you think you're going to survive? You're not. They're going to probably kill you pretty quick or take you captive and torture you and all kinds of stuff. But Jonah walks the street of the city and nobody touches him because they knew that God was with him because he got swallowed by this great fish in the belly for three days and now walking among us there's something different about this man. Something different, and that's why they don't do anything to him. Because in verse 5, Jonah 3, verse 5 through 7, so the people of Nineveh believed God. You think they would believe you if you went over to the Middle East, one of these cities, and walked around preaching on the corner? You think they'd believe him? No, they wouldn't believe him. But they believed Jonah because of what happened to him. Now, Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, to put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Neither man nor beast, herd or nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. So he shut the city down. The king did. He knew Jonah. He didn't want to mess with Jonah's God. Because look what they did. You see, one thing about Nineveh, and that they would worship anything and everything, they had a, a fish god that they would worship. Archaeology has dug up all these things and found what they worship. And here's one picture of that one in the middle. Maybe a little hard to see, but it's uh, archaeology. A man with the head of a fish, arms, got a tail, and legs. Here's a, a second picture of it here, so how it would look, an artist's conception of it. Scales, a tail head of the fish, they worshiped that. So when they got the news that Jonah defeated this fish, this fish couldn't kill him, and they worshiped fish, it got them really thinking then that this true God, he's, he's got it on our God. This little fish God that we have here, he's nothing compared to what the real God is. And uh, and then go verse Jonah 3, 8 through 10. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. The right one. This is the true one. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from violence as in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. So they repented. They changed. All because of Jonah. His preaching, yes, but also what had happened to him. Three days. Now you just don't live through that. Here he is walking among us. They knew that God was with him. And then that brings us back to where we started in Matthew 12, 39. Well, the people were wanting a sign. Show us a sign. And verse 40, there's the sign, he says. You remember Jonah and the great fish in the belly for three days and three nights? The sign I'm going to show you is going to be very similar. I'm going to die. I'm going to be in the grave three days and three nights. I'm coming forth. There's your sign. And would that convince them? Maybe some. 
but not, not everyone. The people repented in the day of Jonah because of what they saw. They saw the sign. They could accept it or reject it, and they accepted it. And now Christ says, I'm giving you a very similar sign, the one that you're familiar with. You know Jonah, you know the story, the truth behind it. I'm coming out of the grave as well, just like he came out of the belly of the fish. And you have a choice here if you want to believe it or not. And he tells the man in verse 41, there's one greater than Jonah here. One greater than Jonah standing right before you. And the resurrection is going to be the greatest sign you're going to have. They had other signs. Or is Christ doing miracles? They should have believed that, but they didn't. But here's the greatest sign, the proof, the proof of all. When he comes out of that grave, then you will know that he is the Son of God. No doubt. And then you have a choice to repent or not, just like they did in Nineveh. Nineveh changed. And here he is hoping that when people see that, him walking around out of the grave, people will change as well and they will repent and change their lives. So that's the sign of Jonah being in that belly and coming out. Belly of the fish coming out. And people knew about it. People saw it. Talked about it. It went on and on and on for ages and ages. People would listen to it. The sign of Jonah. Christ. Here's your sign. Look at Jonah. I'm going to do something very similar, but even greater. Any comment on that? On Jonah? All right. We'll conclude here. About time for the bell. Or we'll take up another topic next week.
Everything got kind of quiet. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each and everyone out to the services here at the Vernon Church of Christ this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we know we have some visitors. We ask you, if you would, to fill out an attendance card along with our regular members and drop it in the basket in the foyer when you're leaving so we have a record of your attendance. Uh, on our sick list today, uh, Joe McNeese is uh, still sick at home. Alvin <coughs> Rector is at home. I understand he's in serious condition at this time. Uh, Tim Griffin, who attends the Mount Pleasant congregation, is in DCH Hospital in Northport recovering from a stroke and request our prayers. Uh, Jacob Griffin uh, also attends the Mount Pleasant congregation. It's taking cancer treatments and request our prayers uh, this time. Uh, Danny Ross Johnson is in the hospital in Tupelo. Uh, Will Bailey, a friend of John Ross, is in the uh, Northport. Is in North Alabama hospital recovering from a stroke. Uh, of course, remember our shut-ins and our prayers. Uh, Robbie Collins, Laura May Edwards, J.C. Hutchinson, Alton Rector, Martha Rye, Joe C., Norma Stanford, and uh, Mary Thomas. Upcoming events, we have several. Of course, Bible Bowl practice at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon uh, here at the building. And the Bible Bowl is here at Vernon uh, tonight. Uh, I think uh, there's still maybe spots or two for some sign-up in the only sheet uh, for items to bring uh, for that. Tomorrow night, 6 the 16th, at 6 o'clock, a men's leadership training class. We want to encourage all men of the congregation to uh, attend this. Uh, we've already said it'll last roughly an hour. Uh, so uh, all the men are encouraged to attend this. Uh, January the 28th has a men's day at the Winfield Congregation. Uh, there's some information about that on the bulletin board. Uh, January the 29th is the fifth Sunday uh, fellowship with a one o'clock noon uh, service to follow the fellowship. Services this morning, uh, Brother Austin Brown will be directing our mind in prayer. Those he read will be taking, uh, doing the Lord's Supper and the prayer for our contribution. Uh, Eddie Finch, our regular minister, will be delivering our service. And uh, Glenn Barton will be directing our song service. This time, let's go to the Lord in prayer on behalf of our sick. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for the avenue of prayer. We have to come before thee and offer up our petitions. This time, we pray that you'll be with those that are sick, those that we know of, those that we may not know of. Pray that you'll be with each of them, be with the means that are being used to treat them. Pray that they will be back in our midst once more if it be thy will. Pray that you'll be with each of us as we go from day to day. To help us to live and conduct our lives in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Follow John wholeheartedly in our services. Help us uh, to realize the uh, blessings we have. And before OZ comes and offers uh, Thanksgiving for our offering, let's sing the chorus of Count Your Blessings. Something a little different today, but Will Allen's going along with me back there. <clears throat> All right, let's sing. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Good morning. The reading this morning pertaining to our offering we give to the church is going to come from Malachi 3, verse 10. 
Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for another day of life you bless us with. Thank you for another day we have to come here to church to worship you and uh, another day to come here and say thank you, God. Thank you for all we have in our lives. For we all know that everything we have comes from you. We're just so grateful that you continue to bless us with so much. We'd like to give back a portion now, Father, you bless us with that maybe we could do our part to help somebody in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, the first verse of number six. <clears throat> Sing. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of focus our minds as well as our hearts on taking the Lord's Supper. The scripture reading this morning is going to come from Matthew 28, 1 through 9. And after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him because it uh, became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who, is cru who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There, will, there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met with them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we'll thank you for this day. Thank you for another day we have to come here to gather around this table and take this memorial feast. Thank you for this bread, Father, which is to us as a symbol of our Savior's body as he went to the cross that day for our sins. If we take it now, help us to remember the pain and the sacrifice he went through for us because he loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a like manner, Father, we'll thank you for loving us. Thank you for this cup with this fruit of the vine as a symbol of our Savior's blood that they shed on the cross for our sins. We take it now, Father, we pray to be pleased and accepted on thy sight. Through Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen.
congregation. I hope you can be here at 6 o'clock and, and be a part of that. Any questions, let me know. We'll, we'll give you an answer. When it comes to our Bible study, sometimes we focus on one thing or one character that we see there in the Scriptures. And uh, something that we fail to do sometimes and realize is there is a Scripture before it and a Scripture after it. Or it may be a, a story that we're reading and may have one main character in it, but there's other characters as well that are involved in this. And it would help to look at their part that had, they have in the story itself. Take, for example, you have, you have Joseph. We know Joseph's story, how he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, Joseph went through a pretty rough uh, time there, being in, in prison as well at one point. And then Potiphar's wife got after him, and that got in the trouble there in prison. And then we know how he eventually made his way up to be that of, of a second in command in Egypt. Well, how many times have we ever stopped and looked at his brothers, what they were going through, what they maybe during that period of time, the guilt that was on their heart, and how maybe they, they suffered as well, knowing that they treated their brother in the wrong way. They looked at their father grieving every day, there's a story in itself to look at them to study their life. Or what about David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba when the child came into the world and, of course, the child died? Have you ever looked at Bathsheba's grandfather? Oh, well, he's in there. He's, he's named, and, and look what he did. Of course, he was a man as well that didn't like David after the way he treated his granddaughter, and, and he went and, and changed sides, you might say, and... That's a good story in itself, but the Bible is full of that, of individuals and events that sometimes we get focused on one person, one event, and then after that, maybe there's others that really played a part to the story. Well, this morning, we're going to look at an event, Naaman and the young servant girl. Naaman's life, we know a good bit about his life. Uh, this young girl, we don't know much about her. We don't even know her name. But she was responsible for Naaman being cured of his leprosy. And we come across this story in 2 Kings 5 and verse 1. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria, he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So Naaman had a good pedigree. Now here he was, he was the commander of the army of Syria. This army, on different occasions, would go and, and they would make war with Israel, and they would win. God used uh, Israel's enemies to, to uh, dis discipline them. In this case, that's what would happen. So Naaman, a commander of the army, a great man, an honorable man, a man of great valor, but the thing that most people realize, remember about Naaman is he was a leper. And he certainly was that. How long, we don't know. Probably a good amount of time. A leper, and during this time, of course, there was no getting over it. If you had it, you died with it. So here's a great man. A man of valor, honor. A great commander. And then, in verse 2, and the Syrians had gone out on raids, and had brought back, a, brought back captive, captive a young girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So as Syria is doing battle against Israel and defeating them, they bring some back. They kidnap them. In this particular case, this young lady, this young girl, became a servant of Naaman's wife. So here she is. One day she's happy at home with her family. And the next day, she's been ripped apart from her family, led away from, to another place, to a strange place, to a home she's never been in before, and now she's been being that of a servant, and she's probably not liking it. I know I wouldn't like it. Any of us would not like it. For some reason, today, we're taken away from our home, and we're made a servant, never see our family again. I mean, it's just all an uproar and a whole new place that you're unfamiliar with. But that's where she finds herself. She's in that situation, and probably you wouldn't think she is very happy. 
But your thoughts might be, well, what about escape? Reckon she's going to try to escape? Well, she might try that, trying to get back home. She might even know, well, Naaman is the one that, that captured me. Naaman is the one that brought me to this God-forsaken place. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll poison him. I'll poison his food. I'll show him you don't mess with me. All these things could have been going through her mind, but it wasn't. Those things hadn't, it wasn't, she wasn't thinking that way. Instead, here's what she was thinking. Verse 3. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. She's wanting to do good to the very man that kidnapped her, that tore her away from her home, from her family, that brought her to a strange place, that made her a servant or a slave pretty much here at his house. And she's thinking about his well-being. I doubt if we would be thinking that way. I doubt if we were to switch places with this young lady. I don't think we'll be thinking, now how can I do good for this man? My one lady I serve, her husband. How can I do good for that? I don't think so. I don't think we would, but we might. But yet this shows something about this young lady. That she had some good training somewhere. Somebody taught her about the one true God, taught her about having compassion on others, taught her about loving your enemies, taught her about many things, and here she is putting that on display. She's loving her enemies. She's doing good to those who persecute and use her, as Christ mentioned over there in the Gospels. She's doing all these things because she was taught well to respect others. She was taught about the one true God. And on and on it could go about that. She remembered. Maybe she remembered a little bit about Joseph's life. How things got pretty rough for him. He was carried into another country as well. But yet everything worked out. And he came out on top. Maybe she's remembering that story. Or maybe she's remembering something about Job. How he had a rough time of it. And yet everything worked out for him. But whatever it may be here. She says to the lady, Naaman's wife, who she is working for, I know a man back in Samaria, a prophet, who can heal your husband. He can do it. Well, in verse 4, And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. So apparently the young lady tells Naaman's wife, Naaman's wife tells Naaman, Naaman goes to his superior, his master, and says, this young girl says there's a man, a prophet, and he can heal me. Can I go? Can I go and, and see if this is true, that I, if I can really be healed? And the man says, his master, sure, go. And as you go, take all kind of gold and silver and clothing and if he does heal you, pay him for this thing. Show your appreciation. And sure enough, as we know how the story goes, Naaman goes. The prophet's name is Elisha. Elisha tells him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And you'll be healed of your leprosy. At first, uh, Naaman refuses. But then he comes around. He dips seven times. His leprosy is gone. When he comes up out of that water the seventh time, he has the skin of a baby. Leprosy's gone. And he's rejoicing about this. But did he ever thank that young girl? This, this is the last time we hear about her. Did he ever go back home and, and go to her and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you told me, told me to do? Did he give her a promotion? Did he maybe put her up somewhere, no longer is she going to be served. Maybe people will be serving her. He appreciated that much. Or maybe did he say to her, I'm going to let you go home. You didn't have to do this, but you did. Thank you so much. Go back to your home. Go back to your family. We don't know. But I can certainly see Naaman doing that. I think I, if I was in his shoes, I would have done something to show my appreciation for what this young lady did, and she didn't have to do it. 
She didn't have to serve Naaman in a way, Naaman's wife in a way that she did, but she helped him out because she was a lady, a young lady who understood what it meant to be a child of God and what it meant to be thinking of others, even loving your enemies. What kind of attitude do we have when it comes to serving, helping, or teaching those who aren't so friendly, for those who are our enemies, for those who don't have our well-being you know, in mind, the best of us in mind? What about those individuals? You know, the Lord loves them, and the Lord expects us to teach them as well. Maybe that's something we have forgotten, but he expects us to be kind to people, and a great commission going to all the world, not just to those we know or our friends, but do our best to teach everyone. What about that? This young lady here is displaying that. She went to those that were her enemy and talked to this man about God, and I guarantee you, I don't know what name and who he worshipped or what he worshipped, but after this, I have a good feeling he worshipped the one true God after this. It worked. When tragedy comes in those individuals' lives that we don't like so well, do we rejoice? Do we say, well, they deserve that? Maybe this young girl, she could have said, you deserve that leprosy, the way you treat people, being mean to them, ripping us away from our family. You deserve that leprosy, and you should die with it. But she didn't do that. She helped the man out. Remember, it go back several years now. On that Sunday night, it was around 7.30, 8 o'clock, President Obama came live on television and he said that Osama bin Laden is dead. You remember that night? Or maybe you didn't see it until the next morning, hear about it? Well, if you recall, when he put out that message that he was dead, in a lot of these big cities... Now, there was all kind of celebration going on. People were chanting USA, USA, and, and chanting, we're glad he's dead. He deserved to be dead the way what he did to the, to the, to the nation, our national 9-11, and on it goes. And people were rejoicing because the man was dead. And, and I tell you, I was a little bit happy myself. The justice had been served. Maybe you were, I don't know. What was God doing? What was God thinking when those SEAL members went in and killed this man? What was God's opinion or attitude toward this? Here's what it was, Ezekiel 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? In 1832, for I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God, therefore turn and live. God didn't rejoice when Osama bin Laden died. He didn't shake his fist in heaven and go, USA, you really got him, way to go. It saddened God. Because this man, Osama bin Laden, had a soul. And God wanted him to be saved. Now, he had a choice. But yet, God wanted him and all to be saved. It saddened him. As he says there, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. No pleasure. This young lady had no pleasure in seeing Naaman suffer. She had a cure. She knew a man that could do it. And she went and told, put the wheels in motion for what could be done for him. In Psalms 25, verse 7, David says, Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Remember me, David says. This young lady Remember Naaman. She was full of goodness. She was a kind young lady, and she remembered him. 
and told him where to go and what to do. We go back to 2 Kings 5.3. This young lady had confidence of what the prophet would do, Elisha would do. She'd probably seen him do many things before. If you look in the scriptures, I was told this last week, Elisha did more miracles than anyone else in the Old Testament from a prophet's standpoint. He was active. He was doing things. And, and she knew this. She knew this. And because of that, she said, he can, he can heal him. He can do this. It was Elisha who uh, healed, raised the dead. It was Elisha who uh, got the woman's, the widow's oil and, and she never ran out. It was Elisha who put salt in a, in, a, in a lake for the people to drink and made the water sweet. It was Elisha who did a lot of things. And she knew that. And she knew the power of Elisha and what he could do. And yet, confidence that he would heal Naaman. Confidence in that, that he would do this. Confidence he wouldn't turn him down. Oh, I don't want anything to do with you. Here you are from Syria. You've been destroying people. She knew Elisha wouldn't do that. But instead, he was healed. She wasn't ashamed. And we can't be ashamed either. As Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Have you ever saw somebody when they, they became a Christian, or maybe you heard about their becoming a Christian, and you probably said, he was the last person I ever thought would do that. I never thought. But that's what the gospel can do. The gospel can change a person and bring them to a place in their life where they realize, you know what? One day I'm going to stand before God, and one day I'm going to give an account. I need to get right now. That's what the gospel will do. And that's what this young lady did. She turned Naaman in the direction of Elisha so he could be taught, at least shown the way where his leprosy could be taken care of. And that's why, again, what we find back in 2 Kings 5 and verse 3, she showed him, she put him in the right direction. It was also important here that she would be the middleman, as we might call her. Because she was the one that uh, put the two together. And it may be that you may look at your life and say, well, I could never teach that person. I don't think I could. Well, you probably can, but sometimes we just need confidence in knowing that we can. But what you can certainly do, you can be that middleman that puts the person in, in connection with somebody who can. The young lady... She couldn't heal Naaman, but she put him in connection with somebody who could. And that would be Elisha. That's what we got to do. We got to be compelling. We got to make sure that we are sold on this thing called Christianity. That we're sold on this that one has to be saved or else they will spend an eternity in the devil's hell. Sold as to who Christ is. In Luke chapter 14, uh, the parable of the great feast. There's a man, a master, who prepares this great feast. He invites his friends, and, and they give excuses. And then the master says, go out. And here in verse 23, then the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. And they did. People came in, and they were filled. But look what he told his servant there, and compel them. Compel them. Just don't go out here and say, hey, won't you come on in and eat? Compel them. Look what's on the menu. Whenever this, this servant went out and started telling people, this is what's on the menu. This is what we're going to be eating, what we're going to be drinking. Here's what the dessert is. Here's all this great time we're going to have. And you, you don't have to leave, eat till you get full. And making it where well, they want to come in, compelling them to come in. They didn't, he didn't drag them in. With his words, he compelled them to how great the feast would be in this master's house. And that's what this young lady did. 
2 Kings 5 and verse 3, she knew this prophet could heal him. And there she was convincing enough to him for him to make the step and to go and to be healed. And he did. He was healed. Who knows where his life carried him after that. But yet here's a young lady. And we all know the, the uh, story of Naaman and everything that happened there. But how many of us ever really stopped and thought about this young lady? Just one little line, a couple of verses about her. Well, she made a difference in, in Naaman's life. Study these individuals. And we can learn from them. And who knows when we might be able to make a difference in somebody's life as well. There may be that connection that puts them in contact with somebody that can teach. There may be that example that shows them that there's a better way than living out here in the world. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to become that Christian. As the, there the, as the parable spoke of about being compelled, it's worth it. It's worth being able to lay your head down at night and to know that if I don't wake up in the morning, I'm with my Lord. I'm there in a great place of paradise waiting to, for heaven to be my home one day. That's compelling. And the blessings of having a larger family and the blessings that all come in, that are involved in this is compelling. If you're not a Christian, why not be baptized in the Christ this morning? Let him wash away your sins. And by doing so, you know your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name is written in heaven. Why not do that this morning? Or if you just need prayers to come home to our Lord, do the right thing as well. If that need is there in any way, come as we stand and sing our invitation.